Hi, I'm Whitney Espick, the CEO of the MIT Alumni Association, and I hope you enjoy this digital production created for alumni and friends like you. Welcome to MIT Faculty Forum Online. I am Erin Winnick, a space science communicator and former space reporter for MIT Technology Review, and I will be serving as your moderator today. Uh, you can find me on social media platforms at Erin Winnick or ErinWinnick.com. But for today's broadcast, uh, it's sponsored by MIT Federal Credit Union, uh, MIT Professional Education, and MIT Sloan Executive Education. And as a reminder, we will welcome your questions during, um, during this chat. Alumni joining us via Zoom can use the Q&A feature found on your toolbar, and we will be sure to get to as many questions as we can. Today we are talking with Dan Hastings, who holds a master's and a PhD from MIT in class years 1978 and 1980. He is the Cecil and Ida Green Education Professor at MIT and Head of the Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics. For he Professor Hastings was named Head of the MIT Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics effective January 1st, 2019. A link to his full bio can be found in the chat window. So please welcome Professor Hastings today, who will begin by sharing some highlights from his first year leading the department and an update on what we can expect in the coming year. Professor Hastings. So Aaron, thank you very much. Uh, what I'm gonna do is, is start by actually sharing the Aero and Astro Department uh, you know, strategic plan, what we said we were gonna do, what we're doing, and to some extent how we've responded to the COVID uh, you know, crisis. Uh, and then you know, I'm, I'm available, of course, to answer any, any questions. So let me start by uh, sharing my screen, share screen. All right, is it good? Can you see it? So uh, th this is the strategic plan that we actually finished before the COVID crisis. And as you know, a part of how we think in the Aero Astro department, we say to look, at, to look ahead, look up, because we're looking up and looking to the future. And part of the reason we did this is it precisely captured by this uh, launch uh, of SpaceX, the Crew Dragon demo, uh, which was the first crewed space mission from American soil in, in uh, uh, a number of, uh, quite a few years. And, so, and it was absolutely the first privately owned spacecraft that was actually launched with crew on it. Uh, and what it illustrates is uh, the growth of entrepreneurial aerospace. And this is one of the drivers for our strategic plan that that's what was now actually uh, occurring in the space business, as opposed to what I think of as government-driven uh, uh, aerospace. So because of that, uh, we, we did a, uh, a new strategic plan. Our previous plan was done in 2015 and actually had no mention of uh, you know, what was going on in entrepreneurial aerospace. And basically, in this strategic plan, we were driven both by the growth of entrepreneurial aerospace, and also by the creation at MIT of the College of Computing, which I'm sure many of you have heard of, and by the continuing emphasis upon importance of, of diversity and inclusion in, in the aerospace field. And you'll see all of those elements uh, in, as drivers and how they ended up uh, shaping what we said. So we, we created a vision statement, which was aimed at the future, and aimed at how it is we wanted to actually, of course, affect uh, the society and the economy and the environment and continue to push the boundaries of the possible. We focused upon what it is we do in terms of educating uh, uh, students to be leaders, to be creative engineers, and, and what we do in terms of creating new technologies for the environment, uh, uh, for, for security and for the economy. We uh, redid a refocused our values. So values at MIT the last year have gotten a great deal of uh, discussion. Uh, we, were, we were ahead of the MIT discussion uh, because we felt it was just very important to say, here are the things that we really are at the center of who we are. So ethics and integrity, leadership through excellence in education and research, and 
succeeding together and creating an open, diverse, inclusive, and supportive community. These are the things that we want to more than anything else, you know, define us by what we actually do. Even as the technologies we, we generate and the leaders we, we generate go off to do great things and their, their technologies change over time. To give you a current a sense of the department structure now, uh, you know, we, we and precisely because of the uh, College of Computing, we reorganized ourselves into an air sector, a space sector, and a computing sector. So the computing sector is where the, all the work that goes on on autonomy, autonomous vehicles, autonomy with human beings, uh, the work that goes on on computational science and engineering. And between these three sectors, we think ourselves as taking inputs, great students, uh, and having outputs, great alumni and, public, and publications and ideas and patents and methods, all the things that over the years we've done actually well. To give you some sense of our numbers right now, um, uh, we're you know, order, um, I think 30, 36 faculty were full time and then a number of faculty were joint. We, we are running 173 undergraduates. You recall that uh, undergraduates are with us for three years. So, you know, that's order uh, 60 ish, 50 to 60 a year, pretty stable. Um, 246 graduate students. Now we now have more PhDs than we have SMs and, uh, and a growing but still small number of postdocs. And one of the things, of course, we care about a lot is uh, and are responsible to the Institute for uh, how many women faculty we have, how many underrepresented minorities uh, at, at each level. So you, so you see the numbers there. I, I think we are, in terms of women in our undergraduate body, uh, steadily moving up we we continue to be i you know challenged i would say in our graduate student body um uh, and and you know in terms of postdocs we're doing you know reasonably yep. uh, why is it there we go we we uh decided to focus in our strategic plan on seven strategic thrusts and i i really held the uh faculty to seven because as I kept saying to them, I can't remember more than seven things. Uh, so yeah, although the real purpose from my point of view was having focus. If you have too many things you say you're doing, you just won't actually get to them. So I, I'm going to describe uh, each of them in more detail, but basically they came down to a set of things we, we thought defined the future in terms of, of research. We, we cannot do everything. We don't have the people to do everything, but we, what we do, we're going to do with excellence. And we felt these things were important in terms of research and we could do them with excellence. A set of things we needed to do because of the College of Computing and, and a set of things associated with how it was that our, our culture and leadership emphasis was actually uh, shifting. So, so uh, as an aerospace department, there's a, there's a set of core capabilities we say we need to maintain be, to be an aerospace department. We need to know how to design vehicles, aircraft, spacecraft, uh, air transportation systems, so on. We, we need to know how to do computational engineering. Uh, you know, this is fluid mechanics, plasma physics. I mean, all the things necessary to do serious computational engineering. We, we need, because everything, you know, well, not every, but every system, but many of the systems are involved with humans collaborating with the system. We need to understand human system interactions and collaborations, and we deal with very complex systems. So we need to maintain faculty capability in those areas. And then in terms of our, our, our research thrusts uh, that I, I showed uh, previously, uh, they, you could think of them as cross-cutting the core capabilities. So they pull from among the capabilities and they act as kind of centroids of focus for us. And you see the three there, which I'm gonna describe in a bit more detail uh, you know, right now. So, so the first one is autonomy. You know, we, we, have, we have had a growing emphasis in autonomy and autonomous systems. We currently have a, in the, uh, something of the order of eight or nine faculty who are working substantially in this area. And we said, now is the time to go to the next level. So the time, the next level 
is not just autonomous systems, but autonomous systems and humans working side by side, cheek by jowl in real world systems. And once you say that, you realize that you need to, to talk about systems which are, you can trust. You can verify, especially if they're self-learning. So you may verify them initially, but if they learn, how do you verify them over time? And, and how do you verify that they're going to act and work safely with human beings? So that's the emphasis there. We're collaborating with a number of people across uh, the institute. So the SEC is, just, is the College of Computing, Institute for Data Systems and Society, the Lab for Information Decision Systems and CSAIL. And as, as an example, Professor John Howe, who's in, in this group, he's been working <coughs> very actively on uh, trajectory planning models that allow you to, that, that make the drones fire, fly autonomously through unexplored areas, like for example, through a forest, <coughs> a low level, and avoid all the trees, uh, you know, and, and do it as fast as you possibly can. I mean, the, and, and they're not run into anything either. So uh, the, he, that's what he is doing. He's one, an example of some of the things that we want to continue doing in this area. Uh, our second research thrust is in small satellites. So uh, the, the CubeSat revolution has uh, really come a long way since it was actually first created uh, out at uh, Stanford. Uh, and uh, what we think is the next generation is not just small satellites, but how do you get these satellites to work together in constellations and in swarms? So, so we're looking at satellite clusters, new architectural concepts in space, uh, uh, servicing of satellites, assembly, manufacturing. Um, uh, all of these things are very important. And what you see is a picture here of uh, Professor Kerry Cahoy. She's running, a, she's going to be running a mission called CLIC, which is a laser communication mission, uh, where you have a bunch of these uh, CubeSats actually all talking to each other over laser comm and using their distributed uh, sensing capability uh, to compute uh, and, and to exchange information over a, essentially a much larger aperture. We're also working with uh, Earth Atmospheric and Planetary Sciences, Lincoln Labs, Aerospace Corporation, and JPL. So lots of interest in this area. So the third area in terms of, of research was this, uh, understanding and reducing the environmental impact of aerospace systems. So in air, it's primarily, of course, the emissions from uh, jet engines. And, and in space, it's primarily orbital debris we were, we were talking about. And so we said it's important for us, uh, since this is uh, in some ways an existential problem, it is important for us to address this problem, both at the level of what we can do to mitigate it and at the level of monitoring it. And so uh, this, from space, you can do a great deal of monitoring, of course. But, but we're also very interested in what you can do with, with regard to our fleet architectures of aircraft, electric aircraft, things you can do to engines to reduce emissions, things you can do to reduce fuel burn on aircraft, um, intelligent ways you can actually fly the aircraft to reduce fuel burn. Uh, so we're, we're looking at all of these issues, working with, again, EAPS, this technology and policy program, since there's a lot of policy initiatives, um, working with Aurora Boeing, which is close to us, uh, NOAA, and, and so on. As an example, Professor uh, Barrett made a lot of uh, press over <coughs> designing and flying the first ever plane with no moving parts. It was driven by what people call the ionic wind. Uh, with, with, you could think about it as an iron engine where you've taken off the, the outer parts of it. And, and just accelerate the ions and they collide with the neutrals and therefore that's how you get to, uh, thrust going. Uh, completely silent and run entirely on electrical power, of course. Um, at MIT, as you, as you probably know, that the, there's a lot of, of initiatives going on. Uh, there's the Schwarzman Schwartz, College Computing, the Quest for Intelligence, IBM a, uh, Watson AI Lab, uh, and because of the Schwartz I mean, College of Computing, which is, uh, you know, for those of you who've been at MIT a long time, you know, MIT does not change very rapidly. It's, it's the biggest change at MIT 
since basically uh, Shas was created in the late 50s, so it just shows you how frequently MIT actually changes. Uh, but with this college computing, which is meant to uh, create dual competency in, in students so that they know, you know mechanical engineering, computing, aerospace and computing, uh, you know, and uh, everything, physics and computing, uh, with, with this college of computing, uh, we, we decided we, what we can offer to the college of computing is our expertise in autonomy. It turns out the aero department actually has the biggest group in autonomy at the Institute with, with almost with nine faculty. And we also have one of the biggest groups in computational science and engineering. So we said as a, as a strategic thrust, we will lead the development of the college of computing education programs in that area. So this is proceeding. We're going to be offering up in the fall uh, uh, things that will eventually go towards a minor, an undergraduate minor in computational science and engineering for our undergraduates. And we, we will also offer up over time uh, specific programs in autonomy that uh, you know, students can actually uh, be taking. And there, there you see a picture of Julie Shah, Professor Julie Shah, who does human robot interactions talking with, uh, I guess, one of the robots and the students around. Yeah. Right. And this is a quote from, from Julie, which shows why it is that you know, our faculty, that is aero faculty are, are involved in this is because the idea of designing for a combined uh, human machine system grew out of aerospace because pilots had to work with intelligent systems in the cockpit to fly these very complex you know, aircraft. The other thing, and the next thing we said, uh, also driven by the emphasis on now more uh, digital education, is we said we really needed to rethink our education for the fact that our students are coming to us as digital natives. That is, they, they, since they were born, they knew how to use smartphones and you know, uh, the web and so on, which is of course not true of most of the faculty who were born long before that. Uh, now, so what we said is we needed to understand what that actually meant in terms of our students and how our education should be changed as a result of the fact that we were dealing with these digital natives. This was before the COVID crisis hit. So we, we, was, we had started to do some planning and started to think about how we move some of our courses online uh, and what it, what, how, do we, how do we mix the physical and the virtual and so on? And then the COVID crisis hit. And, and in two weeks, we, along with the rest of the Institute, had to go from teaching physically to teaching virtually. Uh, so that's what we did. We, we moved 20 plus classes and all our business operations online. We ramped down all of our on-campus uh, research that was physically based as opposed to computationally based. Uh, and we discovered a whole bunch of things. We, we, we discovered that we had to, for example, all the students went home, not all of them went to places where there was great internet connection. So we had to provide equipment for them. Um, we, we, we ended up doing a bunch of virtual thesis defenses. You actually see one of the thesis defenses there. And uh, we, we moved our lectures to a big garden lecture online. We did a, we moved our, we created a virtual barbecue, if you can imagine that, as well as did our commencement ceremony online. So in a sense, this thing that we actually said before it hit, we were forced into it at, at a high rate of speed. Next, we said to, to respond to the, frankly, the lack of diversity and, uh, and inclusion in the aerospace business, we said we really want to focus upon improving ourselves in terms of mentoring, advising, diversity, and inclusion. Uh, and we want to understand the best practices that we have been doing that, that exist that we can do to improve our, our climate. So we're here, we're working with the Vice Chancellor, the Associate Provost, and the Institute Community and, and Equity Officer. Now, of course, in the last few weeks, there's been a whole set of activities that have been ongoing um, you know, responded to that, including today, of course, Juneteenth, as well as the shut, shut down STEM activities we did just a few weeks ago. Uh, and, as, and as a final of the seventh thrust, we said, look, we, we recognize that our students and our alumni are, are you know, 
want to be entrepreneurs. As a matter of fact, our data from our alumni indicated that more and more of them were more alumni than you, you guys and gals were creating companies. So we said, we, we really want to make innovation a key part of what it is that we actually do in the, in the Aero Astro department. So, so we, we've done that. We, we, we're trying to create a, for our graduate students a, uh, a, a, um, a certificate. So our graduate students, as well as doing a PhD, can take a certificate in innovation and entrepreneurship. Uh, uh, and we're, we're going to do a number of other things. What, what you see here is actually a company, uh, Optimus, uh, that uh, one of our faculty has actually created, that's Satosh Karaman. That's his company. That now is running a whole set of autonomous vehicles over in South Boston. For those of you who remember the Wright Brothers wind tunnel, uh, after which, which was, of course, built before the Second World War, well, we're rebuilding it. Here you see it, uh, uh, Anthony Zolnik. It, it, it's been torn apart and is being, going to be recreated as a much more efficient wind tunnel, much quieter wind tunnel, much better flow, flow in it. Uh, we, it was going to be done by the end of this calendar year, but because of the COVID crisis, all construction was stopped. And they just restarted it actually uh, last week and we'll finish up sometime next year. So in summary, let me say, I, 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 I'm going to argue we're a great department. We're in world-class institution, as you know, uh, be, and because of that, that makes us better. We, we, we have a, a history of leadership. We have very distinguished and energetic faculty, got these directions. Our students are passionate, lots of exciting things happen. And we're committed to continuing to change the aerospace uh, profession. So with that, let me stop my uh, share and see who, what questions I got. Yeah, thank you so much, Professor Hastings. That was really interesting. Um, a reminder to alumni viewers, uh, you can ask questions of the guests today using the Q&A feature in Zoom. I know we've had a couple questions in the chat. If you wouldn't mind going ahead and popping those over in the Q&A, um, you can actually go in there even if you don't have a question and upvote the questions you're most interested in hearing Professor Hastings answer as well. So I'll just kick it off with um, one question of my own and then as people are filling in the Q&A, uh, you mentioned at the beginning um, Demo 2, and then towards the end, you mentioned companies like Optimus Ride, which are obviously very different. Um, how do you prioritize your department working with these private companies um, and, and incorporating that into the learning for students? Um, so we, we work with, you know, private companies in a number of different ways. So in, let's start with education. We, we actually, in uh, invite sometimes our private companies to participate with us in the you know the, the uh, design things that we that we do in our undergraduate and our child graduate education we do them because of course a a betters our accreditation body requires them but we we invite the companies to actually participate so you know we we've had uh, uh, Boeing Aurora, uh, you're involved in some of our aircraft, uh, you know, design things. Um, in the past, we've had actually, when there was Hughes, we had them actually involved in some of our uh, space design things. Now Boeing actually involved. Uh, so in that, in that way, we, we, in our educational sense, we, we participate. Now, in our research sense, we also have uh, research grants with and talk to we have research grants right now with Blue Origin. We have research grants with Lockheed Martin, with uh, Boeing. Uh, you know, we, we talk to Airbus all the time. So all of them are providing ideas and we're providing what we believe is outstanding research for, for these companies. So, so, so in, in that sense, we're, we're actually um, agnostic with regard to the companies we work with, right? We, I mean, you know, we work with companies, we, we work with the government. What matters to us is we're pushing forward the boundaries of the possible in aerospace, right? Definitely. All right, I'm going to go to our top voted question right now from Stephen. Um, MIT a a grads were heavily involved with NASA and the Apollo program. To what extent are MIT grads involved um, in these days with SpaceX, Virgin Galactic, um, United Space Alliance, NASA, and ESA? Well, 
when I when I go to those places, typically when I go to those places, we have you know alumni uh, get-togethers or meetings and so on. Uh, so when, when the last time I went to SpaceX, the room was filled with MIT alumni. You know, there must have been forty MIT alumni in there, and we, and we talked and so on and so on. Right? We uh, the, the same is true at NASA. I, I actually you know, we uh, for. For we are, I believe, either the first or second largest provider of um, alumni to JPL. So if you go to JPL, last time I was there again, we had a room that must have had 60 people in it. You know, so you know we're, we're providing alumni to those places. They're doing a a great job, and whenever I go to those places, they like to come out and talk about uh, you know the good times as they remember uh, when they when they were when they were at MIT. So. The answer is alumni are going out all over the place. Same is true in the Air Force. You know, we have a lot of alumni in the Air Force. You know, so very proud of that. It's part of our leadership in the in the country. Yeah. All right. Next question is from John Wade. How do you couple ethics and integrity and the issues of environmental, societal, and economic su um, sustainability into your design and decision process, both in uh, education and in research? So, so that that's a really good question. Uh, and I'll, I'll give you several different um, kind of takes on it. Uh, so, so, so the first is, you know, again, so I mentioned ABET earlier, but the ABET uh, accreditation requirement for our undergraduate body requires us to actually talk about issues of ethics and integrity in our undergraduate education. And, and we, we try to do that, particularly through uh, the discussions that occur in the uh, design classes, you know, you know, what, what's the purpose of the things we're designing, how are people going to use them, you know, and, and so on. Um, now, in, in terms of the, um, our interactions now with the College of Computing, the College of Computing, Julie Shaw, who's, who's a faculty member in Aero Astro, actually is leading the efforts in the College of Computing around uh, societal issues and ethics and you know and, and integrity and and we you know with her I hope to be a critical part both of the education and of the research that, that that's actually done there right I, I would say that that's the the major ways we're doing it the, the other thing you you'll notice is in the department now we have a very strong ties with the technology and policy program uh, and very often the students who come to us who do dual degrees from the TPP and Aero Astro are precisely the ones who are interested in thinking and doing research at that interface, right? So they, they, want, to in, they want to both study, you know, space systems and then study, you know, what are the ethical implications of, and of what you can sense with these space systems. They want to study the, what you can sense with the aircraft systems and what, what, what does it actually mean in terms of you know, good to human beings and so on. Right? So we actually have a whole bunch of those students in the department, I, I would say. So it's both in research and in education, I believe we're, we're, we're doing something. Now, I, I actually personally don't believe that we're doing enough in that area uh, because these issues are just so important. So one of the things we want to do, we want to try to do is actually turn up the, if you want the gain on them and get our students more involved in thinking about those issues. Yeah, very interesting. Um, now we have a question um, from Christine, um, following up on some of your diversity comments. Um, on the diversity thrust, is Aero Astro making any efforts to increase recruitment of and applications from female cap, um, faculty member applicants? Uh, she mentions for mechanical engineering, increasing female faculty has um, demonstrated to have better correlated with uh, student gender ratios over time. Yeah, so, so the answer to that is, is <clears throat> you know, absolutely. I mean, we, we, we the, the way the School of Engineering works these days is that uh, when, when a faculty member retires or leaves, the a faculty slots go back to the dean and, and we have to uh, basically request them back. And this gives the dean the ability to do uh, strategic uh, re um, reappointment of faculty slot. And on, on average, we get one faculty slot a year on average. So and for every slot we say we get, we say it is critical for us to really look for 
and try to uh, recruit, uh, you know, uh, female candidates for those faculty slots. So last year, uh, we we did we actually got two slots and we hired one female faculty member, one one male faculty member. Uh, this year we got one slot and uh, we, we actually interviewed a number of female faculty, but we ended up hiring a male faculty member. But so, so we're, we're really trying to increase the emphasis on getting more uh, female faculty to apply into our pool and then really uh, make, uh, look, uh, then being interviewed and you know, choosing from you know, the best from among them. It's important to us to do that. It's important to me personally. It's important to the Dean of Engineering. So, so absolutely. Now, it, it turns out if you look at our numbers uh, of the, we, we currently have a, a seven full-time faculty who are women in the department. And we have, uh, you know, three uh, joint faculty. So that's how you get 10. We in the School of, of Engineering as a percentage I actually have one of the larger percentages, if not the largest, of women faculty in as a percentage of the total faculty in the department. In that, in that sense, we do slightly better. We do we do better than the School of Engineering, actually. Uh, but I, I actually agree with what the the uh, um, the questioner said. Uh, we we actually want to hire more uh, you know women into the department because we we want to be. As, as welcoming as possible to uh, you know women students and and women students seeing women faculty is important so the answer is absolutely we're, we're trying our best we want people to apply hopefully we'll get a slot this coming year out of the dean and we'll, once again we'll be looking hard for candidates to who are female great um, all right, next question we have uh, is a lot of people want to know the answer to this one. It makes sense since it's an alumni crowd. Um, how can alumni play a greater role in the teaching program to share industry experiences, especially, as you mentioned, things are more virtual right now? And that question is from Michael. So I, that, actually, that's a good question. So, so one of the things, of course, we, we've discovered <coughs> with the COVID uh, crisis and everything moving virtually is that in some ways, it's actually easier to get speakers you know, because they don't have to fly to come to us, right? So, so we, we did our, our, our gardener lecture which Charlie Bolden gave, you know, completely virtually. We had Deborah James, you know, formerly, the former SACAF give a, another lecture for us. So, uh, the, so the answer to the question is we, we actually want to have more of our alumni in, in a sense virtually come back and talk to, to the students and talk, talk to the faculty. I, I was on the Zoom the other day with one of our alumni uh, and I invited him back uh, to talk in the fall about how he sees things moving in the air transportation business because that's what he's actually doing, studying the air transportation business. So uh, now that th this can occur in two ways and it can occur formally in a class setting and there are some classes I know Professor Balakrishnan in her classes brings in uh, some people via Zoom. Uh, Professor Newman ran a space policy class where she had a number of people come in virtually via Zoom. So it, it can occur in those classes. It can also occur just as special seminars that, that uh, are given by alumni. So the answer is yes, want to do it. COVID-19 has actually showed us it's actually easier than we thought you know, to do this and we'll, once we restart in the fall, I, I anticipate we'll have much more of this. Okay. Now our next question is uh, space focused. Uh, with the return of human spaceflight capabilities to the US and the Artemis program promoting an ultimate goal of boots on Mars, what is the department doing to tackle the larger and complex challenges of long duration spaceflight missions? Ah, oh, that, that's, really, that's a really good question. Um, so, so you know, I, I, we are actually working with, with Blue Origin to put the, to provide uh, some payloads for their lunar lander. Uh, but, but that doesn't get to the really long-term, you know, missions because the mission to the moon is relatively, you know, short-term. Uh, one of the things we want to do is this. We, we, uh, are, are we have what well, used to be the manned vehicle lab, now the human systems lab, is where the, the focus of that effort is, has been 
Uh, and I, and if, if for those of you who actually looked at the ad we put out for faculty hiring this last year, I said one of the things we need to do is, is hire up somebody you know, in, in the area of space exploration, but particularly humans in space. Um, and in particular interest is exactly that. What you have to do for these long uh, you know, duration missions in space. So the answer is we want to hire somebody. Now we couldn't actually find anybody that passed our, the MIT bar this last year, but if we get another slot, that will again be one of the priorities. So I, I would say we're doing some work. I mean, that's occurring in human systems now. We need to actually grow it because the problems are so important. And, you know, we, we, as you know, the department had such a large footprint in the Apollo program. I cannot imagine that when we get to a Mars program, whatever that's called, that we won't have a large footprint. I want us to have a large footprint, but we need to get people in there. Sure. All right, and before the next question, just want a reminder that if you have more questions for Professor Hastings, pop them over into the Q&A and go in there. We have a lot of questions there now. Feel free to upvote the ones that you're most interested in being asked to him. So uh, for the next question, we have a lot of people that have upvoted this question. What is your outlook for federally funded research? Given the poor economy, it's possible federal R&D budgets will be cut. How will this impact MIT and specifically your department? All right, so uh, a, a, a number of things. So so the first thing is, oh, over the years in the School of Engineering, uh, the school has been, has been actively working to diversify uh, the, the base of support. So federal R&D in the School of Engineering, as I recall, is down to something like 62% of the funding. I mean, it used to be 100. It's down to 62, right? Uh, and where's, where's money coming from? It's coming from, I mean, the rest of the money. It's coming from industry directly, right? It's coming from some uh, foreign governments. Um, uh, you know, we have a big Portugal program. We have a Singapore program, you know, and so on and so on. So, so uh, this, this was done quite deliberately at the school level so that we weren't so dependent on the vagaries of federal R&D funding. Now, so that, that's kind of a meta statement. Uh, the second thing is, you know, our, our Washington people actually tell us as a result of the stimulus funding that, that federal R&D funding, uh, you know, that we might be able to get access to, obviously by means of competitive proposals, uh, might actually go up <laughs> in the short term, right? Because in the stimulus funding, they put a bunch of money into various of these agencies, right? And, and MIT has a very good track record of winning proposals. You know, typically on average, MIT proposals win between 30 and 40% of the time, right? So which is, which is much better than the average across research universities. So, so we might actually be able to get some more R&D funding, you know, uh, from, from the federal government. Uh, so, but, and, now, having, having said that, the, there is a number, of course, of uh, large-scale uh, problems that we think are important that there may not be that much federal, may not be that federal funding in them. Um, and one, one thinks, of course, about the long-term environmental issues. So the answer to that is, we think they're important. We're going to make an impact. We, we're out also trying to raise money uh, from philanthropy in those areas. Uh, we're actually both MIT and MIT and Harvard are trying to raise a whole bunch of money in in the environmental area, uh, you know, to fund the, uh, you know the research that we do. So, so, and that's because we think it's important, and 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 we cannot be just driven by what the federal government thinks is important, but we have to be driven by where where the real big issues actually are. So, I I would say. It, 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 is, it con is there some concern over federal R&D funding? The answer is yes, because it, it actually may in the longer term go down. It's quite conceivable after we get past present stimulus. But you know, we, we the, at the school level, and even the department level, we're, we're relatively diversified. We're, we're actually very good at winning proposals. We will continue to do excellent work. And we're, we're actively out trying to raise philanthropic uh, you know, giving. To, as well as giving from industry as well. Interesting. We have another question here from um, Ephraim, who is, it seems 
relatively kind of building on what you were just talking about. So I'll go to this one next. You mentioned early on a focus on entrepreneurship. To what extent do you feel that today's trends towards entrepreneurial funding of aerospace advances are a result of decreased government funding for it? And to the extent that they are, what if government spending priorities swing back? Might an entrepreneurial focus creating a long-term shift, for example, in hiring faculty who will be around for decades in response to a temporary, temporary problem? Well, uh, of course, you, you see, first of all, let me make some comments about the entrepreneurial emphasis. Uh, you, you see really two different things going on. So one, of course, is the interest of the billionaires, right? <laughs> Elon Musk of the world, the um, Richard Bransons of the world, um, you know, the Jeff Bezos of the world, right? I mean, they, they have a lot of money. They've, they, they've invested in Blue and in, and in SpaceX, in Virgin, and so on. Uh, and of course, they're doing big things with that, right? The other thing you see is the growth of a lot of uh, both uh, venture capital going into, into smaller companies. Uh, and, and why is that occurring? It's, it's because the price points for doing something interesting, both in air and in space, have dropped so dramatically. So most, of course, in air it's to do with what you can do with with uavs where you know everybody and their brother can come up with a business plan about what you can do with a uav and and then set up a company to do something with it because it doesn't cost that much to get a, a decent uav uh, or uavs uh, and of course in space is what you can do with cubesats everybody and the your brother can can get access to a, a launch launch a a set of CubeSats and have a business plan associated with it. And though that, those level of entrepreneurs are, are, are not the billionaires of the world, right? That's a pretty broad spread of people who are coming up with interesting applications of, in both, um, both air and space. Now, is it the case that those applications, the, the technologies in both UAVs and small satellites were built on previous government funding? I mean, absolutely. Uh, even even Elon Musk will tell you, the SpaceX couldn't do the things it did if if the government had pre had not previously funded work in you know rocket technologies and and all those other technologies. So so they 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 they're sitting on a pedestal of government funding to actually move these things you know actually forward. Right now, I and now that that's a very long way to answer. I guess the question was do I, do I think the the federal priorities might 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 shift back and displace the entrepreneurial emphasis or something. Um, no, I, I don't think so. I, I think sensible people in the, in the government recognize that where the government has to be is, is beyond where the entrepreneurs are. So, so, so you see the beginnings of both NASA and DARPA, for example, investing in nuclear propulsion. I mean, nobody in the entrepreneurial world is interested in nuclear propulsion, right? I mean, why is, why is NASA and, and DARPA interested in that? It's because that's how you can get, you know, to go quickly to Mars. That's how you can get lots of power in space to do things that, you know, DARPA is actually interested in and move around much more quickly. I mean, and that's no entrepreneurial company is interested in that. There's, there's no commercial use for that kind of stuff, right? So I think as long as the government takes those kind of attitudes, you know, it'll be fine, right? Basically, the commercial world focusing where it makes sense to make money and the government beyond, way beyond that. That was a very long okay. one answer to that question. <laughs> no worries. Um, I think we have time for one more question. So I'll just finish out with, you talked about a lot of different areas of, of research in your talk and in your questions today. Are there any that uh, up and coming areas of research that you think you're gonna make a really big impact in the next decade? Um, so it could be one that you've mentioned already or a different one, but just one that you think would, is, you really wanna hone in on. I would really make a big impact. Well, you know, we, we chose those three areas, um, you know, autonomy and, and human beings interacting and what you can do with clusters of swarms of small satellites, and then you know, environmental mitigation, envir mitigating impact of, of aerospace on the environment, because we thought that those were indeed the big areas that we could do 
you know, for the future. Now, I mean, other other areas, uh, absolutely. Um, hypersonics is one, for example, right? Um, uh, we actually, we do have people that are working on hypersonics, right? With with, with current faculty. Uh, I, I mentioned nuclear before, but but clearly if there's a, a substantial and serious development of nuclear power and propulsion in space, that's game changing, you know? So, and, and if, we, if we get involved in that, we do it with, with our colleagues in the nuclear engineering department. I mean, that's, that's what we decided. So I, I think those are the areas that I, I actually, uh, I would think look to uh, as really being big areas, you know, for the future, right? Um, I, I think, you know, in, ter in terms of, of, let's say, uh, mitigating the environmental impact of, of you know, air transportation, I think we're going to see over time a, 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 a shift to perhaps more electric aircraft on, on, on for short ranges, to aircraft which have much, much better fuel burns, to things that are done to the engines, you know, to mitigate the impact and so on. I think that's going to be a fairly fairly big thing over time not immediately I, I think we're looking at 2040 and that you know to see those kind of things right all right well i think that is all the time we have for today but uh, on behalf of the alumni association thank you for tuning in to this faculty forum online and thank you so much to professor dan hastings for joining us today Alumni will be sure to forward all the questions asked via the Q&A to our speaker and we'll keep the chat window open for networking purposes for another 15 minutes. And a reminder that this broadcast will be available on the MIT Alumni Association YouTube channel within a week of today. You can tweet about today's chat using hashtag MIT alum and send any follow-up questions and feedback to alumni learning at MIT.edu. Thank you so much again for watching. Okay, thank you. Thanks for joining us, and for more information on how to connect with the MIT Alumni Association, please visit our website.